today's class, we're going to review some of the ideas that are necessary to uh, understand before we move on. The first is the law of constant composition. And the law of constant composition states that the uh, elemental composition of a pure compound is always the same. So if you go to the Andromeda galaxy and find some water on some planet circling uh, one of the stars in the Andromeda galaxy, you're going to find that the water there is still H2O. Water is water. Uh, physical properties are things that you can measure, such as uh, density, melting point, boiling point, and they tend to be the same no matter what, uh, as long as you have the same substance. The chemical properties are the result of what the, the substance will do if you push it, place it with other substances. An example of that would be to uh, say that uh, it will react, for example, hydrogen will react with oxygen and form water. Uh, chemical properties are what affect chemical changes. Uh, and the other thing I wanted to just draw your attention to was how to separate mixtures. A lot of what we call analytical chemistry is based on using diffusion or differences in, uh, in boiling points to separate complex mixtures. So you'll see a lot of things about that involve distillation, where you boil something and you boil away the water or the, or the solvent that's in it and it leaves behind another chemical. Filtration, we all know what that is when you put something into a, uh, uh, a filter paper, the solvent comes through, the solid particles remain behind. You can also use magnetism to separate particles. Uh, say if you have iron particles mixed in with sulfur, a magnet will pull them, the uh, iron particles out and leave the sulfur behind. Sifting will, will leave behind lumps if you pass it through a grate. And of course, density differences will cause things to, um, to stratify. So if you, mixed, if you made a mix of oil and water, the oil and water will stratify and the denser thing will go to the bottom. The oil is usually dense, is less dense than the water, so it goes to the top. And it floats on top of the water. The more important thing I would like you to understand today is the base units we use in science, we use these six most of all, especially if you're taking a chemistry course, you need to know what mass, length, time, temperature, amount of substance, and electric current are measured by. Units are, units are, are things that we use by agreement. We've agreed that a one kilogram mass uh, is roughly 2.204 pounds, and there are mass standards that are kept, I don't know where, but there's some mu museum somewhere where they have actual mass standards, they have a length standard, the, uh, they have a second standard, and so on. The Kelvin temperature is the absolute temperature scale that they use because they want the temperature zero to be the lowest temperature that you can reach in the universe. The lowest temperature you can re reach in the universe is minus 273.16 degrees Celsius. But minus 273 is not a very practical number. So they've, they've devised the Kelvin scale, which starts at zero. So the lowest temperature in the universe that you can reach in the Kelvin scale is zero, and we call that absolute zero. At absolute zero, uh, there is no heat energy in an object. You can't get colder because it doesn't have any energy to give off anymore. And uh, if you want to measure how much of a substance is present, we use the mole. The mole, by definition, is uh, 12 grams of isotopically pure carbon-12, meaning if you had a sample of carbon atoms and they were only carbon-12, 12, 12, exactly 12 grams of carbon-12 will equal 6.02 times 10 to the 23 atoms of carbon. Don't worry about that just now. Uh, we're, going to, we're, going to, we're going to pick that up next chapter. The ampere, by definition, is the amount of current that passes through a circuit with a... Uh, voltage difference of one volt per second, if I remember correctly. Now, we don't use the luminous intensity of the candela because uh, it's, not a, it's not useful to us in chemistry, at least not at this point. Now, the more important idea here is that units are often combined to make what they call derived units. Many useful units are made by combining kilograms, meters, and seconds, and I'll, I'll give you several examples here. If you want to uh, measure speed, you use units of meters and seconds. So when you say something is traveling at 30 meters per second, you've, you've talked about speed. If you talk about velocity, you're saying speed with a direction. So velocity is a vector. 
which you're going to learn about in the math classes as well. Acceleration is when you have a speed that's increasing. So in that case, you have a speed of a, meters per, a certain meters per second, and then a second later it's going a little bit faster, so it's a new speed of meters per second. So they've added a unit of seconds squared, because it's meters per second per second. The next level of complexity up is force. If you apply an acceleration to a mass, you have to exert force. So if you can imagine a block of ice sitting on a skating arena, almost zero friction. If you just touch the ice block, it'll start sliding, it'll slide for a long time. You can almost say it's zero friction. Now, if, you, if that block of ice weighed exactly one kilogram, and you were to accelerate it at one meter per second squared, you would it would require a force of one newton for it to accelerate at that rate. And that is the definition. That is the definition of the newton. It is a force of uh, one newton. Is it a force of, uh, that is necessary to accelerate a one kilogram block at a rate of one meter per second squared? A force of one newton is about equivalent to the weight of an apple in earth gravity. So if you can imagine holding an apple in earth gravity, that's about one newton. The next level of complexity up is work. What is work? If you apply force over a certain distance, say I take this book and I and I push it so that it moves from here to there, I've done work. And that work requires a force measured in newtons, and the force is applied over a distance of x meters, so it's newton times meters. If you look at the base unit, it's going to be kilogram meters squared per second squared. Notice how force is kilogram meters per second squared. Now that I've multiplied it by meters, it becomes meters times meters, which gives us meters squared. And the next level of complexity is power. If I do a certain amount of work in a certain amount of time, I've developed power. I can have more power if I do the same amount of work in a shorter time. So because work is measured in joules and, and time is measured in seconds, then the units of joules per second has a name, it's called the watt, and it's, that's a measure of power. The base units for the watt are kilogram meter squared per second cubed, because you'll notice Work is kilogram meters squared per second squared. If I multiply that, or if I divide that by seconds, now the second becomes seconds cubed. So notice how the combination of three base units gives rise to five useful derived units. Speed, acceleration, force, work, and power have, respectively, the following base units. Meters per second for speed, meters per second squared for acceleration, kilogram meters per second squared for force, kilogram meters squared per second squared for work, and kilogram meters squared per seconds cubed for power. That makes it a lot easier to memorize if you put it in a line like that. And you see that it all builds up gradually. And I'll tell you that in uh, your university courses, you're going to see these ones a lot. You're going to see a lot of joules, and you're going to see watts, potentially. Or uh, sometimes they don't use watts to describe power. They might use, for example, horsepower. One horsepower is equal to 745 watts, if you like you can describe the power of your hair dryer in horsepower. A typical hair dryer draws about 1,500 watts, which is the limit you can plug into an, out, uh, an outlet in the wall. If you, put it, if you try to take out more than 1,500 watts of power, you blow the fuse. So your typical out, outlet has two horsepower. If one horsepower is equal to 745 watts, 700, 745 watts times two is almost 1,500, which is close to two horsepower. Okay, now we're going to try a little bit about scientific notation. It's just a little bit of review. Uh, any number can be shown as a decimal with one number to the left of the decimal point multiplied by 10 raised to a power. For example, the number 4,300. The number 4,300 has a decimal place. What is green? number 4,300 has a decimal place right here. But if we count that decimal place over one, two, three times, we can rewrite it as 4.300 times 10 to the 3. The power is determined by the number of jumps made by the decimal. Or suppose you had 0 0.00043. Instead of writing it that way, you could count how many times you'd have to jump to get to the decimal place right here. So you'd say 1, 2, 3, 4. That equals to 4.3 times 10 to the minus 4. Not because you've moved to the right. 
the power gets smaller. So some examples. The distance from the Earth to the Sun is 93 million miles. You can rewrite that as 9.3 times 10 to the 7. How did I get that? I jumped 3 over here, 3 over there, and then one more. That's 7 jumps, so rewrite it times 10 to the 7. 9.3 times 10 to the 7. This is a random number, no. 14 billion 700. I forget what this number symbolizes. Anyway, let's, let's write it as a uh, exponent. 3, 6, 9, and then one more. 10 jumps. So we write 1.47 because that's where the decimal place is now and then times 10 to the 10. And that's how we write exponents. Let's try another one where we have a small decimal place. How would you uh, rewrite that? jumps to get it right here. So you want it so that in scientific notation there's one number before the decimal place and two numbers after the decimal place. In your calculators very often you'll see FSE. On, uh, on One of the buttons will have FSE written on it. The F stands for fixed, the S is for scientific, and the E is for engineering notation. With engineering notation, they like the engineers like to put three numbers before the decimal place. Scientists like to put one number before the decimal place and two numbers after. So if we're going to move the decimal place from here to there, it's going to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 jumps going to the right. So it's going to be 5.27 times 10 to the negative 8. Okay, that's a lot easier to write than this. It's very easy to make a mistake if you're writing all these zeros because you might not write enough zeros. And the cool thing about uh, um, scientific notation is you can just multiply them very easily. Suppose I wanted to multiply 12,000 times 12,000. If I write the answer in, with, and you, need, you need a calculator for this, 12 times 10, 12 gives you 144, and then you have six zeros to deal with. So you just write the six zeros over here. There's your decimal place. You could write the answer this way, 144 million, or you could say, Jump three times, six times, plus two more, eight times. 1.44 times 10 to the 8 is the answer. And if I had rewritten these as exponents, I would have said 1.2 is the decimal place. 3, 4, so it's 1.2 times 10 to the 4 times 1.2 times 10 to the 4. When you multiply with numbers written in this fashion, the 1.2 times 1.2 is going to give you 1.44. And the, you add the exponents, 10 to the 8. You see, you get the same answer. And if, if you're good at using these numbers, and if you know your time tables, you can avoid using calculators for simple things that involve anything that you would see in the times table.